and welcome everybody to this session. I'm Victor Cuadrado and with me is my colleague Raul Cabello. And in this session we will talk about Kubernetes security, pod security policies and what happens after the removal and deprecation. So we're going to see what we have learned from them and what are the alternatives. Okay, so with that said, let's get into it. We hope that you enjoy this session. So the first thing that we need to say now is that everything is a trade-off. Here we have this XKCD comic. I'm not the first one to use it. You see that it's just a loop, no? And the loop starts with everything interconnected, which creates bugs and security holes. And then we get things unboxed, and then everything is more difficult to use, and then we are back where we started, no? The, I think that the, the tag for this XKCD comic is something like, all I want to do is something, is a secure system where, I, where it's easy to do anything I want. Is that so much to ask? Yes, it is. It, everything is a trade-off. It's something that we need to have in mind. With that said, let's, let's move into uh, security in the cluster. So how do we secure a cluster? How do we think about it? We can start by thinking about the four C's of cloud native security. Here we have the four C's. The first C would be the cloud or the data center, no? So the, the computer, the, the networking, the, the hardware that is behind everything. Then we have the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster, which is the second C. Here is where we deploy our workload, no? Uh, it's going to be in our case, workload resources. So uh, deployments, replica sets, jobs, daemon sets, pods, things like that. Once we have uh, deployed our workloads, those workloads are going to run containers, which is the third C. And that is uh, a bit of sandboxing, no? That wraps our, our logic. And this logic is, comes from the fourth C and the last one, which is the code. For this talk, we're going to focus on the cluster and container part, which is the one that is relevant for us. So if we want to secure our, our workload resources in the cluster, how do we do that? Normally, what we do is just have some uh, authentication and authorization for those uh, workload resources. So basically, we use RBAC to secure that part of, 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 the, of the topic and the problem. So what happens once we are done with that RBAC and we allow somebody to create a pod, for example? If somebody can create a pod or update the pod, then they can check the spec inside of that pod. And maybe that's a problem, because if we remember, pods and containers inside have a spec.security context, and there we define the security settings that define the privilege and access control for those containers run inside of the pod. So once somebody is able to check, uh, change the spec of that pod, then we are in a, in a world of trouble. If we remember the security context, uh, it's going to check things like allow privilege escalation, Linux capabilities, and things like that. And we need to make sure that people and users and tools cannot change that, that spec of pods and containers. How do we do that? Well, so far we have been doing it by using pod security policies, PSPs. PSPs uh, come from Kubernetes. They are an entry mechanism. And they're implemented using uh, an admission controller that is inside of the cluster. The admission controller will check every request that goes through it. So basically, with somebody, when somebody wants to create a pod or update a pod, that goes to the admission controller, and then the logic for the PSPs is run, and then we get the behavior. This logic is run, as I have said, for create and update of pods, and they check what, go, what goes into the spec.security context of pods and containers. Pod security policies apply to all the pods in the cluster and check for all the things that come from the security context. So as we have said, uh, file system of the, of the container, privilege containers, read-only root file system, app Linux, uh, I'm sorry, app armors, Linux, things like that. No? How, does they, how do they look like? Here we have a minimal PSP. This is not particularly useful. We can see that the kind of resource is pod security policy. And then in the spec, we are setting the minimal needed, which in this case does nothing. But we get an idea what's the minimal. How does a useful one look like? Well, here we have a useful one. 
here uh, we can see that we are um, setting the, the so the containers cannot be privileged. Um, we are dropping all Linux capabilities. We are only allowing some specific volumes and so on. We can see, for example, that it's also allowing for for ports uh, of containers to be open inside of that pod. For for example, from port 8080 up until sorry, port 80 up until 8080, everything all the ports are open. Okay, we have the PSP. How does it work? How does it get applied? We just deploy this and we are done. Not really. Let's see it with this diagram. So imagine that we are Jorge, which is uh, the user, which is on the bottom part. And we as the user want to just create a pod. And we just do a cube control run of the pod. And then it gets checked by the PSP. And if it's allowed, it gets scheduled. And if not, it gets blocked. But what happens here? What's the rest of the things? Ah, PSPs need to, need to be bound for them to apply to a specific uh, pod, for example. And here it's happening because Jorge is trying to do kube control run and he's doing it with a service account uh, called WebApp SA. And we can check that the, the admins of the system have created some service accounts, in this case the WebApp SA, and have um, done a role binding of that web app SA with the web app role. And in that web app role, we are saying that, that that role can use the PSP. And that's how we bind the PSPs. So if we want to see how that looks in, in YAML, it would be like this. First, for example, we create the cluster role. Here in this cluster role, we define the rules pod security policies use, and then the list of pod security policies that can be used. This would make these PSPs apply. And once we have this cluster role, we create the cluster role binding and we bind it to whatever we want to bind it. For example, we can bind it to specific users, for example, uh, Jorge, or we can bind it to the specific uh, service account, the one that Jorge was using, or we can uh, bind it to uh, all service accounts in a namespace, which is what's recommended because, as we will see, it allows for an easy transition out of PSPs into other things. Okay. Now we know how to set up the, the PSP and how to bind it. Is that enough? Yeah, not really. The PSPs have a lot of uh, settings and some of them cause the request for the pod to be mutated and some of them don't. And one needs to know them by heart. There's nothing to it. So then we get some rules, which basically is, let's say that we have a PSP, you know, and or two PSPs. Which one gets applied? Mm. First, the, the, the rule says that if a PSP can do the thing without mutating the request, that's the one that will get applied. Okay, perfect. That's the rule number, first, number one. If we will need to mutate, that would go to the second rule, which is if, if a PSP will mutate, then one of the PSPs would be chosen from the list and then the thing would be mutated. Which one will get chosen? Mm, actually, it's alphabetical, in alphabetical number, nor, uh, order of the name of the PSP, which is a bit, I don't know, clunky if you ask me. But with this comes a mental model. With this rule, suddenly a mental model appears and, and how people have been using PSPs or, or how the, the community has been using them. This implies that we have first an application specific PSP, no, which applies to the rule number one, which will, which will not mutate the, P, the, the pod request. For example, let's say that we, you have a Helm chart and in that Helm chart inside you have a PSP that is targeted specifically for the pods of that Helm chart and that application and so on. Since it's, since it's targeted specifically for that application, it doesn't need to mutate because it knows already how the application behaves and the application has been written in a way that it will pass without mutating, mutation from the PSP and everything will be secure. The other approach is having a cluster-wide PSP, which will appear, uh, apply to every resource, basically, not every pod. Since it's cluster-wide, it's a catch-all, basically, and then it will mutate. That's another way of, of approaching this, this problem. So either you write PSPs specific for the application in a specific uh, manner, or you write a catch-all PSP that performs mutation. That's the mental model that, that we have at the end. 
Okay, after after this explaining, it has been 10 minutes or so. Um, why are they going away? Well, you can see that it's not as simple as it looks. First, they are not namespace, which means that you have to set up an airbag as you see fit for whatever namespace, for whatever service account, and so on. That means that then you need custom airbags depending on your layout of the cluster and so on, which means that they cannot be enabled by default. Either you go with the app specific PSP or cluster wide, but even cluster wide, you need it's specific to the cluster, not so good. You have the rules about uh, prioritization and things like that, so you don't really know which PSPs apply where. You have the indirection layers of several RBAC, which cluster role and cluster role binding is making this PSP apply and so on. They are not easily composable because the prioritization model is alphabetical and you cannot stack them easily. And also they lack modes, so they, they enforce. Once you have the PSP running, it's going to reject things, no? But you cannot have them warn or audit about things, which is a pity because then you cannot retrofit PSPs easily to a cluster that has already workloads, so you can learn from it and then evolve it. So yeah, it's a bit confusing. And it's it was already confusing three years ago. So for example, in 2019, no, people were already thinking, what do we do? Do we fix pod security policies or not? Well, now it's 2022. We know that they decided to not fix them and move on and find better ways. We know that pod security policies are deprecated and will be removed in Kubernetes 125. So what are the other options? We have two other options. The second option is another in three policy mechanism, which is called pod security. It's more minimalism, more minimalist. It has less moving parts that, the, that PSPs and it's in a way composable with the third approach. So if pod security is not enough for you, you can always go with the third approach, which is an out of three policy mechanism. Normally the in three policy mechanism comes with the cluster, sorry, the, the admission controller inside of the Kubernetes cluster, but you can have the admission controller outside of the, of the Kubernetes cluster installation and just run your own. That's the third approach and that uses the webhook ecosystem and you can use that third approach to work towards uh, standardizing in a policy framework using a policy engine. My colleague Raul will explain it later on. Okay, so for now, let's go with the second approach, pod security policy. What are they? How do they work? Well, pod security policies are just labels in the namespace resource. So it's pretty simple. They are defined in namespace resources. They apply to namespaces. That's analogous to the recommendation for PSPs, which is great. And then they provide three standards. Instead of providing all the options no, for setting up what we do, do we want or not, they bundle all those options in three different standards. Privilege, baseline, and restricted. Those standards can be applied in three audit modes. Enforce, analogous to what uh, PSPs was doing, were doing, and then audit and warn, which are new, and we will see. They are done in a way that it can be enabled by, by default, as we will see. And it's kind of like a step back. You can use plugins and an, an external admission controller, but it's a step back, which is nice. And it has a trade-off. Okay, so they provide three standards, the privileged baseline and restricted. How do they look like and what do they do? Here we have them. It's pretty simple. They are like cumulative no? policies. We have the privilege, which allows for everything. And then if you restrict more things, you have the baseline standard, which basically allows you to deploy a minimally configured pod. So imagine the minimal pod YAML that you need to write for a pod. With baseline, you can deploy it. And then you have restricted, which just follows the current uh, pod best harness, harnessing, hardening best practices. That's it, which is great because you, then you don't need to think. And those standards can be applied in three different ways. Enforce, audit, and warn. Enforce, enforce just makes the violations to be rejected, audit in the, the violations are allowed, which is different, and then they get logged. They go to the Kubernetes audit log and that's it. So you have a log of what, what violations are happening. And warn, they are also allowed the violations, but instead of going to the Kubernetes audit log, a user facing print, uh, a user facing warning is printed. So you do kubectl uh, run or apply and then you get a warning there. 
One thing to have in mind is that the enforce only applies to pods. So you have the rest of workload resources such as deployments, jobs, replica sets, and so on. You try to create one of those, it will succeed. And then once the deployment creates the pod, no, it triggers the creation of the pod, that pod will, will not get created, which will make the deployment in, in a failed state, but that's it. It's something to have in mind. Here's an example of a pod security. Pretty simple. Here we have a namespace, kind namespace, and then we add some labels to that namespace. We are in the, the we are enforcing baseline, for example, for minimal security, and we see that we have also the enforced version. This is uh, could be set to latest, but here we have 124, and basically follows what the community knows up until the Kubernetes version 124. And we can see the new thing, which is audit and warn, which here we are setting to restricted. So basically, this it's enforcing baseline, but it will bark to, to the audit log and warn to the user about the restricted. So we can st uh, start learning about what security problems do we have, which is great. And we talked about setting it uh, as default, no? How do we set defaults for pod security? Well, we, con we configure the admission controller. Here we have the, the thing. We can set defaults uh, privilege, for example, which is the least restrictive, and it's the, that, the one that comes from default. And we also have exemptions. We can, we can exempt things such as usernames, um, resource names, uh, namespaces, and so on. One thing to have in mind is that this has some foot guns because, for example, most pods are created by a controller in response to creating a workload work resource. No? A user creates a deployment and then the pods for the deployment will be, will be created by the reconciler of Kubernetes. So those will not be exempt. Just have that in mind. The same happens for other things. Some fields are ignored, for example, dot metadata or dot spec dot tolerations. You cannot just ignore, uh, try to exempt them and so on. And also don't try to exempt controller service accounts, for example, cube system, because then everything breaks. Okay. Now we know about pod securities and PSPs. How do we migrate from one and another? Well, it's pretty simple. First, we see if pod securities are fit for our case, and then we only we try to change the things so uh, in the PSPs, no? For them to apply on, on namespaces and not mutate things, and then we just perform the, the, the migration. For disabling pod security policies, maybe one needs to re reconfigure the, the cluster to take off the, the admission controller and so on. But yeah, it's doable. That depends on, on per cluster. So for example, here we have the, the PSP from before, and it actually matches pretty well with the restricted standard of pod security. The only thing that doesn't match is host ports, which then we will need to remove which means that then maybe our workload, um, the Helm chart or the application, will need to be rewritten so it doesn't need to have, doesn't depend on having ports open. But that's one thing that we should have in mind. And this is what, would end, what we will end up if we were to try to migrate from the previous PSP. It's just setting restricted as everything and that's it. Um, we could also set it as, as defaults if we want no? for, for the whole cluster. Okay, so as a recap, pod security, pod securities, trade-offs. We have seen they are simple and they are all or nothing. You cannot select some specifics, which is okay. They don't allow mutation. They are only for pods and workload resources in a way. So you cannot use them for ingresses and things like that. They are not context aware, so they don't know what's happening in the rest of the cluster. They don't provide uh, compliance audit checks, so you cannot check, for example, for sister signatures or annotations in things and cool things that you could do in a different way. So the upside. The upside is that it's the same, no? On any cluster that implements them, which then means they are easy to test, they are easy to, to communicate with suppliers, teams, and so on. The downside of pod security is that maybe it's unrealistic to assume that your entire workload fits in the restricted policy, no? I mean, you are, at the end, you are a consumer of applications, of Helm charts, and some of them cannot fit into the restricted policy. So then maybe you need uh, a different way. And for that different way, I have my colleague Raul, which is going to talk about admission webhooks. <laughs>
Thank you, Victor. So as Victor has already mentioned, there are several fields in pod security policy that are not covered by pod security standards. And if you must enforce these options, you will need to supplement the pod security admission with admission webhook. So let's see what's an admission webhook and um, how you can implement one. An admission webhook is basically a HTTP callback that receives an admission request, which is a JSON object. Uh, it will perform some evaluation based on this uh, JSON object. It will either accept the request or reject it with an error message. If it rejects the request, the object will not be created or, or modified or, or deleted. So in order to create a, an admission webhook, you need to provide a HTTPS uh, webhook server that will provide an endpoint for each uh, webhook. There are two types of webhooks. You have the validating admission webhook, which will just perform validation on the request, and the mutating admission webhook, which in addition can mutate the, the request. So let's see what's happening when you try to create an object on your Kubernetes cluster, which will hopefully help us to understand how the admission control works. So let's imagine uh, we are the user and we want to create a pod. Let's see what's happening inside of our Kubernetes cluster. First thing that happens is the authentication authorization. Kubernetes makes sure that you are authorized to create uh, the pod. If that's the case, then it calls all the mutating webhooks one by one with the pod we want to create. It will, uh, it will pass uh, the JSON object of the pod. The mutating admission webhooks, they will perform some validation. They will either accept it or reject it. And they will also mutate the original JSON object. After the mutation, it will perform a schema validation. And after, it will call all the validating admission webhooks in parallel because they cannot mutate the request. It's safe to, to call them in parallel. If one of the validating admission webhooks fail, it will return an error to the user say, you cannot create a pod for whatever reason. If all of the, all the validation are successful, then the pod will be stored in HCD and that's it. Your pod, your pod will eventually be created. So if you want to implement your uh, own admission workbook, as we said previously, you need to implement a HTTPS uh, server. And it has to be HTTPS because it does not support HTTP. So you need to create the certificates and then you will need to pass the, the certificate authority you use for the certificate to the webhook validating object. And you need to provide an endpoint per, per each uh, webhook. Also, you need to create the webhook uh, configuration object, which can be either validating or, or mutating. That seems like a lot of work, but there are open source tools that help you with this process. They are called policy engines. And today we're going to talk about a keywording. Keywording is an open source uh, project. It belongs to the CNCF uh, sandbox. Um, Victor and I were both working in keywording at the moment. Um, keywording integrates uh, with Kubernetes by providing a set of custom resources. These custom resources simplify the process of enforcing policies on your cluster. Policies are implemented as a web assembly modules and they are distributed in, uh, inside a OCI registry. So you could reuse the, the registry you're using for your containers to distribute uh, the policies for keywording. The policies are run inside of the keywording policy server and they are they run in a dedicated endpoint and they are isolated from each other. So let's see how keywording works with this diagram, which will help us to understand how it works. So these are the, the custom resources that Keywording uh, provides, which are the policy server and the cluster admission policy. You also have the admission policy, which is basically the same as a cluster admission policy, but it is a scope to a namespace. You will use a cluster admission policy for cluster resource, uh, uh, resources, for cluster wide resources, or for resources in all namespaces. So what's happening every time you create a policy server, the keyword and controller is continuously uh, watching for new policy servers or for changing in existing ones. And it will be in charge of creating the HTTPS webhook server. And it will instantiate the policies inside of this policy server in a dedicated uh, endpoint. 
that will happen every time you create an admission policy. Keyword then control will say, okay, this admission policy is inside this policy server, so I will instantiate the WhatsApp module, and then I will expose an endpoint for this uh, WhatsApp module for this policy. Then it will also create the web configuration for this uh, for this uh, policy, um, and that's it. Every time you create an object, it will call the webhook will call the policy server, and it will which will call the WhatsApp module, and then it will perform the evaluation based on the policy you chose in the WhatsApp module. As we previously said, all the policies are stored in an OCI registry, so yeah, they will be pulled from the policy server, and they can, you can also use a normal HTTPS server if you want. So let's talk about policies. You can either create your own policies or you can reuse existing policies. If you go to Artifact Hub, which is a, it's an application that enables you to find, install and publish uh, packages uh, for CNCF projects. Um, there is a kind which is called, called Keyword and Policies and you can find many Keyword and Policies there. There are some policies that come from the Keyword organization. As you can see, we have here three of them, which are called PSP. If, if you see PSP in the name, that means that's a PSP replacement policy. You can see it's a verified uh, policy. That means that it was verified that it was uploaded by Keyword and it's also signed with a system. So you could use a cosign to, to verify the, the policy signature. So, yeah, we, we said that a keyword uses WebAssembly for, for creating the policies. Why? Why WebAssembly? First thing, it's because security. Just out of the box, by using WebAssembly, we have a lot of security because uh, by design, it cannot escape the sandbox. WebAssembly modules, they run in a sandbox environment and they cannot escape from there. Also, there are many programming languages that compile to WebAssembly. So you can write uh, uh, policies using your favorite programming language. At this moment, Keyword supports uh, writing policies in Rust, Go, Assembly Script, uh, Swift, and we recently added support for C Sharp. And we will be adding more programming language in the future. So yeah, you can use your existing knowledge. You don't need to learn a new language. As we also mentioned before, it's distributed in OCI registries, which means that you can reuse your existing infrastructure you're using for your containers. Um, as they are WebAssembly modules, they can run outside of Kubernetes. You can run it in a WebAssembly runtime. Actually, Keyword and Team provides a, a, a tool that's called KWCTL, which uh, allows you to run a policy outside of uh, Kubernetes, which is very handy for, for testing your, your policies. Okay, so let's see a policy. Let's see how a policy looks like. This is an example of the replacement for the PSP capabilities. The first thing we see here is the module. This is the WebAssembly module. As we can see here, that's coming from an OCI registry for, for the GitHub container registry, in this case. Then we have the rules. These are the configuration for the webhook configuration object. Um, it will basically tell Kubernetes which resources we want to watch. In this case, we want to, to watch all the pods for the creation and update operation. Then we mark it as mutating. That means that we are going to create a mutating, a validating webhook, which uh, will mutate the original request. And then we have the, the settings field, which this is specifically to, to this policy. Settings are different for each policy. All the other options are the same for all the policies. And in this case, what we are saying is, OK, we want to allow these two capabilities, CHO and kill. That means that if we add another capability that's not in this list, it will fail. And we want to, all, uh, to add this default capability, CHO. So if you create a pod without any capability, it will add this CHO capability. OK, so let's see. Let's see how this works. Let's see how it works in a, in a real Kubernetes cluster. So I have here in my cluster keyword install. Let's first get the policy. This is the same policy we we were saying we were watching before. Let's wait for it to be active. Okay, it's now active. So first, let's explore a bit 
So let's see the, the mutating webhook configuration that Keywarden created behind the scenes. That we went, as we mentioned previously, the Keywarden controller was watching for new policies. He saw the policy, uh, the policy we just created and it created this mutating webhook. As we can see here, it's labeled as Keywarden. That means that it was created by the Keywarden controller. And then we have the configuration here. This is the CA bundle configuration. This is needed for establishing a secure HTTPS connection to the Keywarden policy server. But don't worry, this is all created by Keywarden behind the scenes. So you don't have to really do anything with this. This is the path. This is the endpoint we were say, uh, saying before. Uh, when we created this uh, policy, Keywarden controller created this configuration and also it added a new endpoint in the policy server with this path and it instantiated the WASA module inside this path. And here we also have the name and then the, the configuration for the rules we created with the, the policy. Okay, so let's see in action. Let's try to create a pod with the net admin capability, which is you remember it was not in the in the in the in the list. So yeah, that's why it was rejected. Um as you can see we have a, an error message here. So this is fine. And now let's create a a pod. Okay. This pod didn't have any capability, so that's fine. It was accepted. But if you remember, this is, was a mutating policy, which means that it, it will mutate the, the request. And we added a default capability, which was the CHO. So now if we explore the, the pod, yeah, okay, it is. We didn't specify this capability, but as we marked this policy as mutating and we added a default capability, it is here. And this will happen to, to all the pods that you create. Okay, so this is how a normal policy works in Keywarden. So now let's move into PSP. So we were saying that PSP are deprecated. You should be, you should be moving from PSPs. Um, we also mentioned that in Artifact Hub, you can have a PSP policy, PSP replacement policies. So how you can migrate? Well, there is a great tool built by the app via team that helps you with this process. This tool will fetch all the information for the PSP you have in your cluster and it will transform it into policies, not just for keywording, it also supports all the policy engines such as Kaiveno or Package Keeper. And we created a wrapper based on this tool, which is very easy to, to run and will actually fetch all the information from PSPs and transform it into keyword and policies. There is an excellent blog post that you can find the link here written by my colleague uh, Jose that describes the process of doing this migration. But yeah, let's actually see it in action because it's very easy as you will see. Um, let's see how. Okay, so we have this PSP. This was the same PSP example that uh, Victor was showing uh, before. So let's see how we can transform this into a keyword and policies. We downloaded the, the script we were mentioning before. Um, we run the script and that's it. That's it. It fetches, it fetches all the information in your cluster about the PSP are transformed into, into keyword and policies. So now, once all these uh, policies are created, we can safely remove the PSPs, and that's it. Just one line. And here, we are actually applying the output. You could save this into a YAML file and inspect the policies if you want before actually deploying to, to your cluster. You could also maybe modify the policies if you want to enable the monitor mode, because keyword and policies, by default, they are restrictive, which means that they, they will reject uh, pods if if they violate any of the policies. But you can also enable in monitor mode, which will not buy, uh, reject any object, but it will lock, it will monitor, it will, it will lock that the failure will happen. So you could do that for, for testing purposes. But that's it, I mean, it's very easy as you have to just one line and you can move away from PSPs. 
Okay, so what are the benefits of Qwarden? First thing, it's simple. You don't need to write a custom webhook server, handle certificates, then create a dedicated endpoint for each policy you want to create that's happening behind the scenes. Um, so it, it will save you a, a lot of time. Also, you can verify any resource. It's not restricted to pod. In this example, we saw a pod, but you can actually verify any resource you want. Also, there are many existing policies in Artifact Hub. Actually, the keyword team created a lot of policies based on what user usually needs, but you can create your own policy if you see a user case that's not covered by the existing policies, and you can actually publish to Artifact Hub and other people can benefit from this work and hopefully also contribute to, to that. As we have seen, it's very, very easy to migrate from PSPs. Just run the script and that's it. So now that they are deprecated, you can migrate to keywording quite easily. You can run, you can write your own policy using your favorite programming language. As we said, it's a, if you're using a language that compiles to WebAssembly, you can use it for, for creating a keywording policy. Also, we created a special policy, which is called the Verify Container Images, that will verify container signature based if they, if they are signed using Sisto. If you're interested about Sisto, you can watch our talk, Enforcing a Secure Supply Chain in Kubernetes, where we talk deeper about the Sisto and how you can use Sisto and Keywarden to, to verify your supply, to enforce a secure supply chain on your Kubernetes uh, cluster. Okay, so PSPs are going away. We talked about pod security admission, which are provided by the Kubernetes team. They are built in inside of Kubernetes. They are great. They are very, very easy to use. And yeah, you should be using them if you are not. And then about keywording. Can you use both at the same time? Yeah, of course. That's fine. And what will happen is that you label a, a namespace with a, a pod security standard label, and then you have a keyword and policy. What will happen is this uh, pod will be created if any of these uh, uh, policies validate successfully. I mean, if one of them fails, it doesn't matter if it's the pod security standard label or if it's the keyword and policy, it will be rejected. But yeah, it's fine. You can absolutely, you can have both running at the same time. And actually, yeah, we will see an example. Let's see an example of how you can do that. Let me. So let's, uh, let's create a namespace called test. And now let's uh, label it with uh, the enforced baseline as uh, Victor previously mentioned, this will, this will um, create a, a, the, the post security standard baseline. And it's in enforce mode, which means that it will reject pods. And now let's create an admission policy. This is the, the verified image signature. This is the policy we were talking about, about Sisto. It will verify Sisto images for all the images that comes from GitHub, the GitHub container registry. And for this one, it will actually verify that the signature was created inside of my GitHub account and for this repo. So we have for this namespace, we have the label, the, the post security standard label, and we have an admission policy. So now let's wait for the policy to be active. Okay, so now we have both at the same time. So let's create a pod that will violate the first one the pod security standard baseline, which is a privileged content. So let's see what happens. Yeah, so as you can see here, this violates the pod security baseline, which means that it, this pod was not created. And now let's create a pod that will violate the keyword and verify container image policy. And as we can see here, we're using the unsigned image, which was not signed by Sisto. So yeah, it was uh, rejected by the keyword and admission control. So as we have seen, you can use safely both at the same time in the same namespace. And now if we apply a, poly, a pod that will, that will not be rejected by any of them, that's fine. It was created and that's it. So yeah, you can use both 
safe, safely by use keyword and post security admission. So yeah, that's all we wanted to talk about today. If you want to get involved, please reach out to us in Slack or in GitHub. Feel free to create an issue or contributions are, are always uh, helpful. Um, that's all. Thank you for, for listening. I hope you enjoyed our talk.